I want to talk about some basic coloring techniques that are available to you. You could have used anything for this and you can use anything for this. And I'll show you a few that I brought in today uh, to kind of give you an example, okay? All right, so the first thing we're going to be looking at is watercolor. Now, uh, a lot of you are familiar with watercolor. Watercolor is probably the most simple paint to use. Um, it, it's easily uh, manipulated. That means you can, you, it's easily to put on canvas. A lot of times you use watercolor paper with watercolor. And this is a piece that I finished recently using watercolor. Now yours does not have to be this advanced at all. Now the sky was added in later, so don't get thrown back by that. But this is watercolor, this entire piece here. And watercolor is one option. Now if those of you who have never used, um, let's say, watercolor before, may feel a little intimidated by this process, so hopefully you don't. Um, but watercolor is an option. One of the most popular options um, is, is uh, color pencils, believe it or not. Now this is an old set of color pencils here, and, and, um, but that's another option is color pencils. And um, most, most of the students in the last workshop, and I'll show you an example or two, uh, they seem to navigate more towards color pencil. And again, this is Supernova here. Um, the student that used color pencil for this very lightly applied this technique to her, to her uh, page. Um, we also have another book here from this is Jack and Jack and Sue like fishing too. I think this was actually crayon, believe it or not. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, the thing about crayon is you can feel uh, the texture after it's finished, and anything that's a, a finished piece, if you feel it, it's interesting. Every single medium has a certain feel to it. Um, the pages do, and crayon feels very smooth once applied, um, as well as colored pencil in a lot of ways it does, but not as much as colored as crayon. So crayon's an option, watercolor, color pencil. If you felt really, really motivated, you could use um, paint, but um, this student here used markers for theirs, so you could color your pages using marker. Now the thing about marker, and you could tell on this page in particular too, once you have drawn your piece out in pencil, and let's say you've colored it in ink then, I'm sorry, you've outlined it in ink, and then you go back and you try to color over top of that, what happens is uh, it smears. It has a tendency to smear. So that's one thing you want to watch out for whenever you, um, let's say you've penciled the page, you want to color it prior to outlining it in ink because you'll avoid situations like this right here where um, we've got some smearing, okay? Now I brought in a piece here to show you. Um, this is a little hillbilly character that I, that I actually drew for a previous um, art um, workshop. That's a local access show on Pike TV that I host. And <clears throat> I drew this little guy for uh, one of those episodes. And we'll pull out our color pencils here and we'll, we'll begin adding a little color to this guy, okay? Um, so let's say you've chose color pencil and now here, I have outlined my drawing already in ink, so that's been done for us, okay? The one thing that I want to show students or stress to students when they're using colored pencil is you don't have to really uh, start out pressing down really hard. It's so much better to go from light to dark. So what I like to do is I'll draw a very thin um, a coat, if you will, of the color first, okay? Really lightly pressing down and I'll put this all over the surface of my drawing or the piece, of, the actual parts of my drawing that I want to have this color included. Okay, so I'll lightly press down it first and I'll go over the entirety of whatever it is I want this particular color. Okay, and I'll put this one layer, we'll call it a layer, um, over the entire drawing first, just like I'm doing now. Staying within the lines, of course, okay? and I'll put this one general coat over. Now once I have this, what I could do then is I go back, okay, and I, and, and I start applying what we call um, hue to the color or um, a little bit of saturation. So you wanna 
darken in the areas you want to darken in with this color. And what this does is it allows you to show what we covered last time, talking about how light reflects off of a drawing or, or um, a color piece, okay? So I'll go back over where I've lightly colored in, this time pressing down a little harder to put the color in there, the saturation, or darkening the color in, okay? And you'll see now how this really applies up here around the ear. I want to leave the top of the ear light. So if we were to imagine that um, there's a light source coming down from top down onto the characters, uh, the shadow will be underneath the hat such as this. And the underbelly of our little dog here is going to be darker than the top of the dog because of how light reflects, right? So applying a very thin, um, not pressing down very hard, layer of color to your piece prior to ever finishing it up or, or um, is, is a good way to show how light reflects. And it also gives some variation to one certain color. So you see that I'm not using a few different colors here to get this effect. I'm using one color, <clears throat> but this one color, just by pressing down um, light in some areas and heavier in others, allows for us to see that we've used a variation of this same color in, in its hues and how, how it's a saturation, okay? So, how, and how you press down matters with colored pencils. It matters with crayons, it matters um, the medium, these dry mediums as we call it. Now what we mean by a medium is basically whatever you're using to color with. So your medium could be watercolor, colored pencil, crayon, it could be paint, um, it could be a collage even. That was an option for you in this to um, use your, you know, to use a collage to, to represent your illustration. So hopefully you've um, you started this process already. If you haven't, don't feel too overwhelmed. But you can see now how I've done this with, with the dog here. I've lightly pressed down in some areas. I've, I've pressed down harder in others. And it gives this variation of the color. So the color up here is very light. And as you go further down the dog, it gets darker. And I could keep working with this, um, making it more and more refined as I went along. Okay. Now, one thing that um, I want to show everybody here today while we're working on things is, is graphic novels. So graphic novels are typically black and white and there's a technique called, called cross hatching. Now this is something that I actually put together for another piece but we'll use it for the purpose of explaining what cross hatching is. Um, cross hatching really is using small lines to show shading. So I've got a pen here. This is pencil. This is all this is is pencil. So when I start tracing over my pencil, now we've went over this before on, on um, drawing out your piece and then tracing over it for, for graphic novels. So this shouldn't be anything new that I'm tracing my own work here. But after I've already finished and I've sketched out my characters on, a, on the finished page, I'll go back and you imagine this is one panel. See, it's inside a box, so it's one panel. And what I'm doing, I'm going back over it here and I'm tracing my lines. So this is, this is what you'll be doing for a graphic novel. You'll, you'll first color it, in, not color it, but trace it. Or I'm, I'm sorry, you'll first draw it out in pencil. And then once you've drawn it out in pencil, you'll go back over it and trace it in ink. Okay? Now cross hatching, what cross hatching is, and we'll get into it right here as we finish up this little guy's hand and move into one of these dinner bowls on the table. Okay, we just finished Thanksgiving. I hope everybody had a very happy Thanksgiving out there. And um, so we've got food here on the table. So see how I've inked in this little character standing here? And we have another character standing in front of this bowl. Now, to show um, either light to dark or how light reflects or um, let's say shadow or um, even saturation, like we talked about just then with the brown on the puppy dog, with black and white, you can actually pull that off with using what's called cross hatching. So I'm going to sketch the round portion here of the bowl, and here's the bottom portion that you can see just underneath the bowl, okay? And then we'll add the food, the 
trace over some of the mashed potatoes in the bowl. <clears throat> now what's happened in this particular panel is, and I'll explain this to you as, as I'm finishing up, this little character had just finished, as you can see, getting his mashed potatoes, and he's walked away. And this character is moving down the food line. Anybody that's ever went to a dinner at church or, or maybe a family reunion, <clears throat> you know that the plates are laid out on the table and you walk around and you grab what you want, right? So in this particular panel, this little guy has dropped the spoon down inside the food bowl, and it's his turn to come by and get some mashed potatoes, and he's noticed that the spoon is laying in the bowl. So that's what's going on. So let's add a little cross-hatching now. Now with cross-hatching, you will draw um, parallel lines running right beside one another, just like I'm doing now. See, one line after another, and now I'm going to slowly um, stop those lines, but then you pick back up over here, okay, and you'll draw some more parallel lines. So it's one line right after another, okay? See those series of lines I've drawn? After I've drawn those series of lines, I go back over and I'll draw now another series of lines running in the opposite direction. So it's just like making X's. That's all it is really, making lots of little X's. And this is cross hatching. Now there's one particular artist, his name's Edward Gorey. If you were to research his work or look his work up, he uses cross hatching a lot in his work. Now he's passed away, he was an illustrator uh, who lived um, passed away in 2000, but most of his work came out in the 19, early 1980s and 1970s. He uses a lot of this cross-hatching, and only thing it is is these lines that run in the same direction, okay, and then once you've applied those lines, you go back and you start over again, drawing lines running in the opposite directions. It's like making tons of little X's on your page. Now, believe it or not, this mesh or this cross-hatching, when you apply that to a certain area of your graphic novel, will show shadow. So you can see how inside the bowl, this area that's not colored in, you can imagine light reflecting down on that portion of the uh, panel. Uh, I think I brought in another panel for an example here. Um, for your graphic novel, when you use word balloons, um, one option that you have, and I want to cover this real fast, is to is whenever you're drawing like your speech balloons, if you have the option of um, two pens with different widths, so if you have like a, let's say a thick marker type pen or a Sharpie like this one, and then you have um, a thinner um, marker or pen to, to, to um, um, tr trace over your artwork with, you can actually draw your word balloons and your thought balloons using a thicker pen Okay, and then when you trace over your characters with a thinner pen, you don't have to use one of these uh, fancy pens like this, you know, ballpoint pen even will work. Um, you have a thinner line, so you can see how this line is a lot thicker than this one. And that adds a cool effect to your work. Whenever you can show that the speech balloons and the thought balloons and whatnot are a separate portion from your drawing, if you can show that in some way, um, it adds to the effect of your of your panel, okay? So using a thicker line even will help. Now we don't expect you who are creating a graphic novel um, to color your pieces just because there's there's a whole lot more artwork in a graphic novel than there is say a picture book or a chapter book. So we, we don't expect that. But what we do expect is if you're designing a graphic novel we want your cover to be color. So your cover should be color. Now here's an example from last time. This is, um, let's see if I pull it up here. Um, I've used examples from Belfry High School quite a bit this time. They did a, just a stellar job in the last virtual art gallery workshop. And um, one, two of those students who did a stellar job were Taylor Bush and Abby Hamilton. And this is Confessions of a Jailbird. Now you can see here how the cover is in color and also though the interior drawings that appear. Now this is a chapter book as you can see there's more words but the interior um, drawings that are included throughout the book you know there's there's not as many um, drawings for a, chap for a chapter book than there is um, let's say a picture book you know or graphic novel but we're talking about cover and there are a few things that we need on a cover so I want everybody to pay close attention this is very important. 
for your cover, the things that you will need, you will need a title, of course, that's important, and then you'll also need the names of the contributors for the book. So the in this case, the author and illustrator. So this is two people that worked on this book here, right? So two students worked on this book, their names appear. Now, when designing your cover, even if you're drawing or you've put together a graphic novel, I want your, co your cover to be in color. It's really important. Covers are very important for they tell us a lot about the story before we ever open the pages. Here's an example of this little mini comic that I created for the Challenger Learning Center. Now, I want you to take a look at this cover and I want you to notice a few things going on in this cover, okay? Uh, first of all, we see here that the title is From the Mountains to Mars. That's our title of our, of our little mini comic. That's what this is. And they pass these out over there at the Challenger Learning Center and they take them out to schools in boxes, hundreds of them, and pass them out. So that's what, the, and what this book is about though, this little mini comic, and it tells us down here at the bottom, we, we know a little bit about what it's about by reading the title or the, or the uh, cover. It says, uh, From the Mountains to Mars, so that's our title, and down at the bottom is a short, brief e explanation of what this book is. And it says, Explore the Amazing Life of John Goodlett. Okay, down at the bottom it says, Written and Illustrated by Christopher Epling. So that's me. I wrote and illustrated this. Therefore, my name's on there, and this is a small um, explanation of what's going on. So, just based on this cover here, we see the map of Kentucky at the bottom. We see a star, so we know that this is talking about a certain area in Kentucky. Apparently, this is near uh, Perry County in Kentucky, okay? And from the mountains to Mars, so we know that we're talking about outer space, and we know we're talking about mountains, so a location. And by, by the map of Kentucky, we imagine that we're probably talking about Eastern Kentucky, just, just based on this cover. But there's more that this cover tells us than just that. So it tells us, explore the life of John Goodlett. We know that's the main character or the focus of this story. So we can imagine this is probably John Goodlett here. But also, if we know what John Goodlett's doing, in the background, we see his nightstand or his uh, dresser cabinet. On the top of that, he has a top. He has some cars. That tells us he's a, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's a little boy. He's got toys. And then also he's whittling something, right? So he's creating something. Now, we don't know exactly what this is. Um, we could tell there's a little airplane over here. Um, there's a map of the United States in the background. And if you could see really close, these are math equations in the background. You can't see them very well, but that's what's there. Down at the bottom, though, look, we have model craft, and we have a model craft kit. There's glue, there's the sticks used to put it together. So we imagine that him creating, whatever he's creating here or working on, <clears throat> has something to do with this model craft set. So just based on this cover, we can see that this little boy is interested in creating things that has to deal with airplanes, um, has to do with flight and based on the title from the mountains to Mars we can kind of guess that this little boy may have had something to do with space, space exploration okay um, based on this little symbol here now this is something we want to cover too um, this is the Challenger Learning Center logo and the logo has um, the Challenger spacecraft you know, taking off into orb past orbit into outer space and down at the bottom then we also um, have references to that too, like I said in the, in the model airplane kit here. So on our cover, a lot of things have been addressed, right? On our cover we're talking about specific things like title, we're talking about who wrote the book, who created the book, and we're talking also about what's in the book. So when you're designing and drawing your cover, think about those things. Think about interesting ways to show the reader what's in the book, a little glimpse of what's in the book. Because, see, those of you who are selected to go on and become published authors and illustrators through this workshop will be working, like I said, with you, Pike, and Moorhead to create a business plan. In that business plan, they're going to help you create a website. 
Now, on the website, we want to include certain promotional features, such as a synopsis of the book, so that what a synopsis is is important. Uh, it talks about basically a little hint or um, um, a small paragraph or two or three sentences that tells the reader what the book's about. So like we looked at here with Exploring the Life of John Goodlett, it says, Explore the Amazing Life of John Goodlett, so we know that this is a person who um, apparently lived a, an amazing life, and we're going to explore his life, okay? Um, you want to include a small, brief synopsis or a couple of lines that, that sums up what your book's about, okay? So for Leaders and Legends, you can apply this to your work in the sense that if you, if you wrote about a certain individual, a leader, you could talk a little bit about maybe a couple sentences of why they're important. Um, addressing maybe what it was they contributed the most in. I used the example in McGoffin County of the terrible tornadoes that came through here a few years back. So with those tornadoes, the person could be like, you could write a synopsis um, that says something along the lines of, in, in perilous times, a person stands up to meet the needs of the many. That's a synopsis. That's a small couple sentences that talks about what the book is about, okay? But we'll jump back over to the overhead for a second. I want to show you another important feature of the cover, and um, that's talking about your logo. And I'm going to use a reference here for um, Ted Hudson. Now, I've referenced his work a lot. He is a Breathitt County student. Ted Hudson um, wrote and illustrated Noah's Ark. Now, if you turn on the back, the synopsis is right here on the back of the book. Now, for the purpose of, our, of our, um, workshop, we want you to include, if you can, a synopsis on the cover. If you don't, it's okay, but I do want you to write up one, have ready. In case you're selected to become published, you'll need this. But here at the end, we have one more thing that we need to talk about before we finish up. So, so far, we've looked at coloring your book. We've looked at the importance of a synopsis. We've looked at the importance of a cover and the information that's on a cover. We've looked at the importance of creating a logo. Should you become published, you will need a logo for your work. And now we're going to talk about the process of putting these things together for submission. So really fast, uh, we're going to cover this before we end. Now, teachers, I appreciate you being willing to assist the students in putting together their work for submission. That's first and foremost. Without your help, this would fall apart. So thank you so much for what your, your, your dedication to help them. This is outside the classroom, I know, but this is also an opportunity for the students to venture into language arts, to enhance their skills, and also possibly to go on and become published. So there's economic reasons too uh, in terms of a career, in terms of generating even a partial or supplementary income one day through this work, okay? So thank you so much. So we're leading into week eight. I want to talk about preparing your pages to submit, okay? This is really important. Now, last workshop, what we asked people to do, we asked all the, the teachers to gather up the student works and make copies if they can. So go down to the office and scan those things and send them into us. So scan every page and submit it. And that turned into a lot of, a lot of work for the teacher, I understand. But there was a reason for that, and the reason for it is this, and we'll jump to the overhead and I'll show you real fast. Um, now, by the way, we, we eventually discarded that idea, of course, um, because basically it turned into um, a lot of confusion on, on what to do. But I'm going to bring up Jack and Sue like fishing too as my example for this, okay? So when we asked teachers to scan the work last time, that was to... Um, basically solve problems like this, okay? Now what you have here, and it's not a problem, I don't mean it's a problem, but um, so on this page we have the artwork, so, see, so the student, they drew their artwork in this little box here at the top, okay, to represent a page of the book, and then down below there we have what writing is supposed to appear on this page, okay, um, but this writing has been typed up on a computer, printed on a printer, cut out, and pasted. So our ideas was for the last workshop was if this was going to happen, 
this, the, you know, if, this, if the teacher could scan this page and print it, all this would be on one page. So basically this had no potential. See how the bottom, how I could put my finger underneath those, the, the text on this page. There was no potential for this to flake off, fall off, or become lost, okay? But in order to make everything as simple as possible for this workshop, uh, if, you, if you send in your work, you don't have to scan it this time, but um, I do want you to make sure that if you have text included on a page like this, so if, you're, if the words aren't handwritten, okay? So if, you're, if your words aren't handwritten, such as this one here, I'll pull it up real fast and show you. If your words weren't handwritten, such as this one, okay, then we ask that, you know, you scan it. But for the purpose of this, if you're going to submit it in the way it is, make sure that the words that are appearing on the pages, if you've cut them out, glue those down good. Don't, don't just um, apply a little bit of glue or just make sure, though, that when we receive this work, that there's no chance of these words or, or words of a page falling off, okay? And this is the example of what we intended for last time for the ugly pumpkin. Um, this was put together kind of in the way we envisioned, okay? So in this, if when I open this up, you see the words on this, this page here are not glued on. They're a part of the page. So what happened was the, stu the, the teacher, she, she or he had to have went in, put the artwork down with the words and printed off pages. And then once they printed off all the pages, making up this book, they, they, they printed those pages out, folded it and stapled it and submitted it. So thank you so much for participating. I hope that you're pulling all these pieces together and you're creating something that you know, you're proud of and you're excited about because that's the main thing really. And I look forward to seeing what everybody submits. And remember, go to theholler.org. Resource, all those resources on there. Access those, take a look at them. Use those to your advantage. The person who equips all these pieces together the best has the higher chances of becoming published at the end. So thank you so much for your, for your time. And until next time we meet.